Okay. okay. So, hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to the channel. This is your host Karina and today, as you can see, I am joined by wonderful astrologer John Frawley. Oh, very kind words coming. <laughs> Thank you. So, John is here at the invitation of the Romanian Astrologers Association who wanted to have John here for a horary astrology workshop that you held yesterday. Mm -hmm. So is this your first time in Romania? What is your experience with the Romanian Astrologers Association? Yes, it's m my first time being here. Um, I've enjoyed myself tremendously. The audience is exceptionally warm and enthusiastic. And the response from the audience while I was speaking yesterday was something most unusual. People are actually answering questions and seeming to be learning from what I was saying. And the same people would give the wrong answer and then they'd scratch their heads and think about it and give the right answer, which is really, from my point of view as a teacher, it's really nice to see. Well, I'm learning. Good. <laughs> So. That's that's good. So, um, do you go and do these kind of conferences, workshops a lot? Is that uh, something that I you do on a regular basis? I usually do maybe four or five a year mm -hmm. in different places. Something I enjoy very much. Did you travel to all the continents with the workshops? I've been to. Never been to South America, but all the all well, I've never been to Antarctica either. <laughs> but, uh, there's there's not much of an astrology organisation in the Antarctic at the moment. Penguins have got other things on their mind, <laughs> but um, we're getting there. I speak to a few penguins and we try and do that. But otherwise, yes, I used to do, but uh, I'm not entirely sorry I no longer do that because uh, you can have your fair share of jet lag. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So since. Like, since when did you start doing astrology and why did you start doing astrology? Because yesterday during the workshop you were telling the story and how you got kicked out of school. And, uh, All because of astrology, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what was that? How, what was that like? You want the story again? Yeah, or? you can tell the story if okay. you want. <laughs> Fine. Well, when I was, I said, about 13 or 14 in school, in the English class, English literature class in school, we were studying Geoffrey Chaucer's Franklin's Tale. Mm -hmm. And I said Chaucer was also an expert astrologer. He was the unofficial royal astrologer in the King's Court at the time. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book for his son, How to Use an Astrolabe. Mm -hmm. The only reason to use an astrolabe is to cast an astrological chart. And the Franklin's Tale, or one of his Canterbury Tales that we were talking about and studying in class, hinges on astrology. The woman's husband has gone abroad over the seas and she's worried, how can he possibly come back? We've got the black rocks around the coast, which are too dangerous and would sink his ship. And because of that, she goes to visit the master astrologer. And the master astrologer, having take of his fair share of loot, picks the appropriate moment to work some magical spell to make sure that the seas rise high enough to cover these awful rocks and so the husband can come home safely. Which of course means simply that he knew when the tide was going to be high, not the fact that he actually did anything to make it happen. But this is what the story hinged on and the teacher had given us some astrological explanation for how this happened. And at the time I knew very little about astrology, as the normal child's interest in spooky stuff. Mm -hmm. But even so, I could see that what the teacher was saying about this just made absolutely no sense at all. Mm -hmm. And so I thought up a theory of my own and I put this in an essay. And for this essay, I got the mark of zero out of a hundred for this, which had never happened to anybody before. And a couple of days later, the teacher walked into class and he began the lesson by saying, Mr. Frawley, I have two words for you in basic Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> and he then told me those two words. And <laughs> the first of these words begins with F and you can probably guess the rest of it. <laughs> and so that was the end of my English study. <laughs> um, that was quickly followed by the end of school altogether. And so, as you see, astrology does have quite an effect. Yes, it has like an impact on you. I, I really liked yesterday 
when you discussed, when you were talking about Neptune and Pluto, you were giving them different connotations that we're used to with, with evolutionary astrology mm -hmm. and the way that they're talked about these days. You were saying that Neptune shakes things up and uh, Pluto kind of grabs the person. Yeah. So you related it more to marriage and to couples. Would you elaborate your view on that? Well, I think the idea that Neptune, Pluto and Uranus are planets in the same way as our seven traditional planets, it simply does not fit with the whole system of astrology. Mm -hmm. um, this is something which has been created by late 19th, early 20th century astrologers who had lost sight of where, how astrology is built. And the idea that we have seven planets and 12 signs is absolutely integral with to astrology, mm -hmm. this combination of the three and the four three, the number of divinity, which is why we have the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Ghost as one example of it, and the four, which is the number of matter, the material world, which is why we have four elements, earth, air, fire and water. And so we have three plus four, mm -hmm. which is our seven planets, mm -hmm. which is the limited, the kind of material working out of the mixture of the divine and the material. Mm -hmm. played out against the background of the 12 signs, three times four, which mm -hmm. is the whole potential of how creation can be. Which is why we can only have 12 signs, not 13. Yes. It's about 13th sign of the zodiac. Yeah. There's always that debate popping up. Yes, well you cannot have a 13th, 12th of the zodiac. Exactly. You know, there were 12 twelfths of the zodiac, and that's it. Yes. And the same way to fit in these other planets, it's... It's an artificial creation, some mm -hmm. idea that they can be equal, and it destroys the whole system, the arrangement of the planets ruling the signs. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have the sun and the moon together, which rule the two central signs. Yes. Then the next sign on either side of that is ruled by Mercury, then the next two signs by Venus, then Mars, then Jupiter, and then the final two signs by Saturn. This is integral pattern. But the other three planets, are, they're very much the same level as fixed stars, except the fact they're rather more mobile than fixed stars. Mm -hmm. They're not fixed stars, they must be understood through the myths. Mm -hmm. And that's why there are all these myths up there in the heavens. You know, people today tend to misunderstand myth and think it's some kind of story, sort of less real mm -hmm. than reality. But myth isn't. Myth is something that's more real than reality. Mm -hmm. It's the basic underlying structures behind that reality. And it's more real in the sense that you know, Hamlet is more real than our reality, or Bach's cello sonatas are more real than that. Mm -hmm. So, this enables us to deal with something deeper than our usual conception. And Uranus, Neptune and Pluto must be read mythologically in that way, not trying to force meaning on them because you've decided that they rule this or that sign or this or that house. Mm -hmm. And again, the idea that the planets rule houses in the astrological chart is only possible because they've forgotten the basic conception of how come the houses have their meanings. Mm -hmm. The first house means what it does because of Saturn and then Jupiter gives the second, Mars the third, the Sun the fourth and so on around the planets. And then okay we get to the seventh house which is the Moon. Oh dear we've run out of planets. We don't need to invent some new planets, we just start again with Saturn which gives the eighth house its meaning. In the same way as Saturn gives the first house its meaning, the doorway into life. Saturn gives the eighth house its meaning, the doorway out of life. Mm -hmm. Which is why Mr. Saturn, St. Peter, mm -hmm. who of course was not called Peter, Jesus gave him that name. Oh, look at you. you, know, you must have Capricorn rising. I'm going to call you <laughs> Petrus, stone. Yes. Has the two keys, yeah. the key to that door and the key to the other door. And then Jupiter, ninth house, Mars, 10th house, Sun, 11th house, and um, guess what? The house, of the 12th house, our self undoing, the bad things that we do to mess up our life, gets its meaning from Venus. Hmm. Why do we do these bad things to mess up our lives? Because <laughs> we like it. <laughs> well, I don't know, I'm, I'm English, so I don't know about that kind of thing. <laughs> Like all the English people, I don't have a 12th house in my chart. You don't. No, because I, I, 
don't do these things, but I've heard about them from people from other countries who have these inclinations to, yeah. yeah. So, what is the, the mythology around Neptune that makes it connected to earthquakes? Well, because Neptune, ne obviously enough, Neptune is the god of the ocean, Poseidon. And Homer summed up Poseidon beautifully, the earth shaker is what shakes the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the ocean, is, there's nothing peaceful or spiritual about the ocean. The one thing the ocean never is, is peaceful. Mm -hmm. Even when it's not thrashing around too much, it's got this underlying drive to do that. That's why Jason needed to build a boat to go over the top of it. Mm -hmm. We've got Neptune under the waves dealing with his various naiads and nereids under the waves and suddenly he sees the shadow of this boat going across above his head, the first boat, the Argo, and looks up and thinks, oh shit, my power has been broken. Mm -hmm. And Homer just calls him the earth shaker because he is the one who creates earthquakes and the destruction of Troy. The underlying forces underneath the ground which blow everything up. Mm -hmm. and you can't argue with him. You have an argument with Poseidon, you're not going to win. Yeah. You can, which is why Jason has to sail over the top of him. He doesn't go down and fight him. Yeah. And we can see this, and for instance, beautifully shown in mundane astrology. People talk about mundane astrology and look at the birth charts of countries, which is just a bit crazy. Like countries do not have birth charts. Human beings have birth charts. A country is not an animate thing. If it's not animate, it has never been born. If it's not been born, it cannot possibly have a birth chart. But what is crucial in mundane astrology is the Jupiter Saturn conjunction. And we can look at the most devastating earthquake to hit Europe, the Lisbon earthquake, for instance, which not only destroyed a huge chunk of Portugal, but also turned the whole of European culture upside down. And we look at the Jupiter Saturn conjunction cast for Lisbon before that. We've got this Neptune Mars conjunction exactly on the IC, the lowest part of the chart mm -hmm. underground. Uh -huh. Potential for this earthquake. In the same way, we look at the Jupiter Saturn conjunction cast for Paris the earliest one before 1789, yeah. aha, there's Neptune right on the 10th cusp. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of earth shaking. There wasn't yes. an earthquake, it was the 10th house stuff that got seriously shaken up in that case. It was Neptune at work. And we can see this in people's charts. So I think an example of how but the lectures I record on my website, there's a lot of examples of Neptune in action. Mm -hmm. This devastating turmoil which comes up. Your emotions get turned upside down. Your website is johnfrawley.com? That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah. So what can people find there? Do you offer readings still? Yes, I do some readings. Mm -hmm. the readings. There are I used to publish a magazine, The Astrologer's Apprentice. Mm -hmm. uh, all 22 issues of that can be downloaded free of charge from the website. Mm -hmm. and there are over 200 recorded lectures on the website, Okay, most of which need to be bought, but there are quite a few which can be downloaded free of charge. Mm -hmm. People seem to find them informative and entertaining. I'm sure they do. So you can check out John's website for more information, like in-depth examples of how Neptune works. So, in your opinion, outer planets do give concrete results? Oh, definitely so. And we can see, but to give an example, okay, the ascendant in the chart is mm -hmm. particularly the me place in yes. the chart. Okay. And Pluto, mythologically, is the guy who lives in the basement. Um, he only ever came out once, which is to grab some girl and drag her back into the basement with him. And he did Sounds not. Sounds like a creepy guy. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't throw a lot of parties. He did not invite guests to visit him in the basement. He didn't want visitors. Okay, as an example of somebody with Pluto, right in the me place of the chart, right on the ascendant, mm -hmm. we have this. I'm not sure I can say his name without vomiting or something. <laughs> but Nigel. 
Farage. This moron who hates Europe so much he has to go and get paid for sitting in the European Parliament day after day. But and he doesn't want any foreigners to come into England. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact his name, Farage, does suggest that there have been some foreigners involved in exactly. his... Exactly. Yeah, but anyway, we won't go into that. But he doesn't want any foreigners there and get rid of all of that. But he did himself emerge from his cave, grab some poor unsuspecting German girl and carry her back into England to be his wife. Hmm. Okay, this German girl managed to escape from it eventually, <laughs> but he wasn't living this out beautifully and it works out marvelously in other ways. Another didn't know that. So I, I know that there is a huge like transit going on now with Saturn Pluto the South Node and that's also impacting your ascent and how are you feeling it? <laughs> You're not feeling it? There's, there's no such thing as a transit. Transits have no effect what's going on up in the sky. Now really? it has no effect at all on our charts. Really? As I said in the lectures yesterday, the only time what is going on up in the sky now has an effect on us mm -hmm. is if you want to get a suntan. <laughs> the fact that this planet happens to be something I gave, oh, Saturn and is transiting my sun, oh dear, everything's going so bad. Okay, so everything's going bad for me and for everybody else on Earth who has a birthday the same day as mine. Mm -hmm. And then in a few weeks' time, oh, everything's going to be going bad for everybody on Earth who has a birthday the day after mine, mm -hmm. and then the day after that. So it, life doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. really you can't not. fixate on the transits. Mm, no significance at all. The only effect transits have is to give astrologers something to talk about. <laughs> yeah. oh, is, no. So, I, I really, I, it's, it's really funny what you said about horary astrology compared to natal astrology, com comparing uh, natal astrology to the Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's like, you're really, you think that with horary astrology we have like a palpable, concrete result, so well, that's if, why if you... you want useful astrology, practical answers or something, that's why we have horary. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating study, there's always more to learn things and something a rather more constructive school teacher I had than the other one said that he'd started off teaching maths mm -hmm. but he just got so bored with maths because there's always an answer yeah. so he switched to history <laughs> because there's always more always more to learn and understand and I can understand that completely that's what we have with astrology mm -hmm. if, if we suddenly got to the point where we knew everything yeah, boring that would be yes. <laughs> so and native astrology really has very little practical use. Mm -hmm. Even if you wanted to predict something from a native chart, it would be an immense amount of work. And with so many things, different stories going on all the time. Mm -hmm. And suppose somebody comes to you with a, their birth chart, oh look at my birth chart and tell me when I'm going to get married or when will I get a better job. Mm -hmm. well, the first thing you've got to do is to check out everything that's happening in their chart before that potential time to make sure they're still going to be alive at the time <laughs> which is quite an important factor when they're going to get married it's probably not going to happen after they're dead but it's an absolutely fascinating study showing the more in-depth picture of the way of seeing our existence in reality in very much the same way as a great work of art or literature or music tells us this and we see things we really didn't expect. For instance, you look at the various progressions and returns, solar return, lunar return, when somebody meets you know, a girl or boy of their choice, or when they get married, and we see all these little astrological cupids fluttering around. But you look back at what's going on in somebody's chart at the time their future partner's born, Mm -hmm. You see all these astrological cupids fluttering around in exactly the same way. They don't know this person. We see it in a study I've done, for instance, is with William Lilly's third wife. Mm -hmm. um, she was 30 years younger than him. We can look at her solar and lunar returns when Lily was born, which is quite possibly even before her own parents were born. Mm -hmm. We put all these little cupids flying around in it. Mm -hmm. Or we look at you know, John Wayne Corbett and what happened to him. 
where we look at his chart at the time when his wife was born, mm -hmm. which is a couple of years after him, but in a different continent. So, uh, we've got all these cupids flying around, but we've also got an awful lot of Mars stuff attached to these cupids. Unfortunately Hence for him. him waking up one morning and finding that a, a surgery had been carried out unsuspectingly. Yeah. And that's, that's not supposed to be part of our existence here, the idea that there is this going on long before we're born, yeah. or long after we die. It says something very important about our existence in creation. But can we treat the birth chart also like a boring chart, like to answer the question, why are we here? Yeah. <laughs> it is a necessary part of us going back up there. Yeah. <laughs> we have to pass through this material creation. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, in terms of what are we supposed to be doing when we're down here, no, I don't think we can. Mm -hmm. Because the very important point about the birth chart is that so much is dependent on the life that this birth chart is thrown into. Mm -hmm. yeah. So much that's written on astrology seems to assume that there have only ever been about 100 human beings in existence. <laughs> There's an awful lot of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, any busy maternity hospital, babies being born all the time. A big city, there's a constant stream of babies, and you do not get these completely identical babies being born. Mm -hmm. They have similar patterns in the birth chart, even identical patterns that they can be born at the same moment in different hospitals in the same city. And yet their lives are going to be very different, depending on the background, the parents, the expectations. Common examples I give, you can have very similar birth charts. Um, if you're born in the, the village on the coast, okay, you spend your life going to sea in the fishing fleet, if you've got the same chart and you're born two miles inland at the top of the mountain, you spend your life up the mountain looking after the sheep and the goats. It's the life to which it's put. You don't get the whole story from the birth chart. Yeah. But sometimes you do get... When people are enabled to do something more kind of similar to the sense of an artist can step back and create something, external to the life. We see it, people living out their birth charts very, very precisely when they're playing like the one great film role that they did in their life, mm -hmm. or singing the one song that everybody associates with them, mm -hmm. things like that, the way they live it out. Mm -hmm. It's rather neat, there's so many beautiful examples of this, as with the chart of Johnny Cash, which mm -hmm. I showed exactly. yesterday. Yeah. We can so well see his first big hits. Mm -hmm. in, uh, it yes. Which is the great thing about it, and this has been my full-time job for, goodness how long, 25 years, 30 years, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm still constantly just, oh, wow, huh? Mm -hmm. And what I learn is not just more and more tiny little details. Mm -hmm. It's like you keep riding up to the top of a ridge and suddenly you see this great new vista opening up in front of me. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Wonderful gift. Yeah, that's, that's you know, one of the things about astrology, you can't get bored <laughs> because yeah. there's always something new. Yeah. That's, it makes it a joy to start it. And the great thing is you get paid for doing it. Wow. Yes. <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> you get to travel. It's yeah. wonderful. So do, um, do you have like some, I don't know, some things with astrology that you wish you would have done sooner and you haven't done yet or you still wish to do like some a text, to old text to explore? Like? Oh. Yeah, a million things to have done. <laughs> I, I should have written rather more books than I have. Okay. But then again, I, I had the intention of writing a textbook on natal astrology. Mm -hmm. and the reason I've never really done that is because it was by the time I've finished the second chapter, I've learned so much, I have to go back and completely rewrite the first chapter, mm -hmm. which then means I have to rewrite the second chapter, mm -hmm. oh, and then go back and rewrite the first chapter again. Mm -hmm. And it's because to, otherwise you're just reducing it to simple yes. structures. Yes. Even something like the Horary textbook, which I've tried to make as comprehensive, but 
it's not just about simple structures. We're not just applying n the multiplication tables to every problem. Everything's yes. got to be read in terms of human life, exactly. well, which is rather more complex than that. It's not so clinical as to So what are your plans after you... Finish with uh, your visit to Romania. Uh, yeah, I go home and take my dog for a walk. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, your yeah. dog that's very compatible to you, is it? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, I'm busy waiting. I speak to my dog on the phone every day. <laughs> Despite being Polish, my dog speaks fluent English. Oh. And so at least we speak on the phone. <laughs> that's yes. Daddy, come home. Turn retrograde soon, Daddy. Come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was as you mentioned retrograde. You were, you know, making fun of a little bit of the, the praise about Mercury retrograde. You said, yes. yeah, there is retrograde people all the time. Yeah, of course, honestly. <laughs> You know, the internet stopped working every time Mercury went retrograde. People wouldn't be able to write on the internet about, oh, dear me, Mercury's gone retrograde <laughs> and things. Or um, we all start thinking in bizarre ways when Mercury turns retrograde. It doesn't work. Like mm -hmm. that. The rest of the time, oh, yes, we're just so intelligent and perceptive and our thinking is so good. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with retrograde action. Mm -hmm. If I take my dog for a walk, I don't suddenly become either weak or nasty as soon as we turn retrograde and go back home. And my dog's very happy as soon as we turn retrograde because immediately he sees this mental picture of a nice snack in front of him. Ah, retrograde is good. But, well, John, I thank you very much for taking the time to, to do this interview. I encourage everyone to check out John's website. and So do I. Yes. <laughs> uh, take his lectures, buy his books, get a reading from him. So, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys soon with more videos. And thank you very much, John. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And well, thank you all for listening. Yes, and thanks again to the Astrology Associations for bringing John and making this live interview possible. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye.